All right, here we go again in some more impeachment trials, sadly, but I tell you, this guy, this guy really done a lot of damage to our, uh, to our, um, To our relationships across the pond. Really, really sad that it took a whistleblower just to do his or her job in accuracy towards <clears throat> what has actually occurred here. This will be part three of the impeachment trials, our impeachment hearings that I have labeled as being nanny nanny boo boo hearings. Nanny nanny boo boo, nanny nanny boo boo, you can't catch me, you can't catch me. Well guess what, Mr. Trump, you have been caught. And you just wasn't caught by one particular person, but you was caught by a whole group of people in exchange to these allegations that soon will possibly change from allegations to being facts, to being history. And if that be the case, this is a very, very historical moment for our American democracy here that has been established for 239 going on 240 years. So please listen up. The committee will be holding as part of the House's impeachment inquiry. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess of the committee at any time. There is a quorum present. We will proceed today in the same fashion as our first hearing. I will make an opening statement and then Ranking Member Nunes will have the opportunity to make a statement. Then we will turn to our witness for an opening statement and then to questions. For audience members, we welcome you and respect your interest in being here. In turn, we ask for your respect as we proceed with today's hearing. It is the intention of the committee to proceed without disruptions. As chairman, I'll take all necessary and appropriate steps to maintain order to ensure that the committee is run in accordance with House Rules and House Resolution 660. With that, I now recognize myself to give an opening statement in the impeachment inquiry into Donald J. Trump, the 45th President of the United States. In April 2019, the United States Ambassador to Ukraine, Marie Ivanovich, was in Kiev when she was called by a senior State Department official and told to get on the next plane back to Washington. Upon her return to D.C., she was informed by her superiors that although she had done nothing wrong, she could no longer serve as ambassador to Ukraine because she did not have the confidence of the president. It was a stunning turn of events for this highly regarded career diplomat who had done such a remarkable job fighting corruption in Ukraine that a short time earlier she had been asked by the State Department to extend her tour. Ambassador Yovanovitch has been in the Foreign Service for 33 years and served much of that time in the former Soviet Union. Her parents had fled Stalin and later Hitler before settling in the United States. She is an exemplary officer who is widely praised and respected by her colleagues. She is known as an anti-corruption champion whose tour in Kiev was viewed as very successful. Ambassador Michael McKinley, who had served with her in the Foreign Service for several decades, stated that from the earliest days of her career in the Foreign Service, she was excellent, serious, committed. I certainly remember her being one of those people who seemed to be destined for greater things. Her successor as acting chief of mission in Ukraine, Ambassador Bill Taylor, described her as very frank. She was very direct. She made points very clearly, and she was indeed tough on corruption. And she named names, and that sometimes is controversial out there, but she's a strong person and made those charges. 
In her time in Kyiv, Ambassador Yovanovitch was tough on corruption, too tough on corruption for some, and her principled stance made her enemies. As George Kent told this committee on Wednesday, you can't promote principled anti-corruption action without pissing off corrupt people. Right. And Ambassador Yovanovitch did not just piss off corrupt Ukrainians, like the corrupt former Prosecutor General Yuri Lutsenko, but also certain Americans, like Rudy Giuliani, Donald Trump's personal attorney, and two individuals now indicted who worked with him, Igor Fruman and Lev Parnas. Lutsenko, Giuliani, Fruman, Parnas, and others who had come to include the President's own son, Don Jr., promoted a smear campaign against her based on false allegations. At the State Department, there was an effort to push back to obtain a statement of support from Secretary Pompeo, but those efforts failed when it became clear that President Trump wanted her gone. Some have argued that a president has the ability to nominate or remove any ambassador he wants, that they serve at the pleasure of the president. And that is true. The question before us is not whether Donald Trump could recall an American ambassador with a stellar reputation for fighting corruption in Ukraine, but why would he want to? Why did Rudy Giuliani want her gone? And why did Donald Trump? And why would Donald Trump instruct the new team he put in place, the three amigos, Gordon Sondland, Rick Perry, and Kurt Volker, to work with the same man, Rudy Giuliani, who played such a central role in the smear campaign against her. Rudy Giuliani has made no secret of his desire to get Ukraine to open investigations into the Bidens, as well as a conspiracy theory of Ukrainian interference in the 2016 election. As he said in one interview in May 2019, we're not meddling in an election, we're meddling in an investigation, which we have a right to do. More recently, he told CNN's Chris Cuomo, of course I did, when asked if he had pressed Ukraine to investigate Joe Biden. And he has never been shy about who he is doing this work for, his client, the president. One powerful ally Giuliani had in Ukraine to promote these political investigations was Lutsenko, the corrupt former prosecutor general. And one powerful adversary Lutsenko had was a certain United States ambassador named Marie Yovanovitch. It is no coincidence that in the now infamous July 25th call with Zelensky, Donald Trump brings up a corrupt Ukrainian prosecutor and praises him. Against all evidence, Trump claims that this former prosecutor general was very good and he was shut down and that's really unfair. But the woman known for fighting corruption, his own former ambassador, the woman ruthlessly smeared and driven from her post, the president does nothing but disparage, or worse, threaten. Well, she's going to go through some things, the president declares. That tells you a lot about the president's priorities and intentions. Getting rid of Ambassador Yovanovitch helped set the stage for an irregular channel that could pursue the two investigations that mattered so much to the president, the 2016 conspiracy theory, and most important, an investigation into the 2020 political opponent he apparently feared most, Joe Biden. And the president's scheme might have worked, but for the fact that the man who would succeed Ambassador Yovanovitch, whom we heard from on Wednesday, acting Ambassador Taylor, would eventually discover the effort to press Ukraine into conducting these investigations and would push back, but for the fact also that someone blew the whistle. Ambassador Yovanovitch was serving our nation's interest in fighting corruption in Ukraine, but she was considered an obstacle to the furtherance of the president's personal and political agenda. For that, she was smeared and cast aside. The powers of the presidency are immense, but they are not absolute, and they cannot be used for corrupt purpose. The American people expect their president to use the authority they grant him in the service of the nation, not to destroy others to advance his personal or political interests. Amen. I now recognize Ranking Member Nunes for his remarks. 
I thank the gentleman. It's unfortunate that today and for most of next week, we will continue engaging in the Democrats' day-long TV spectacles instead of solving the problems we were all sent to Washington to address. We now have a major trade agreement with Canada and Mexico ready for approval, a deal that would create jobs and boost our economy. Meanwhile, we have not yet approved funding for the government, which expires next week, along with funding for our men and women in uniform. Instead, the Democrats have convened us once again to advance their operation to topple a duly elected president. I'll note that five, five Democrats on this committee had already voted to impeach this president before the trump Zelensky phone call occurred. In fact, Democrats have been vowing to oust President Trump since the day he was elected. So Americans can rightly suspect that his phone call with President Zelensky was used as an excuse for the Democrats to fulfill their Watergate fantasies. But I'm glad that on Wednesday, after the Democrats staged six weeks of secret depositions in the basement of the Capitol, like some kind of strange cult, the American people finally got to see this farce for themselves. They saw us sit through hours of hearsay testimony about conversations that two diplomats who had never spoken to the president heard secondhand, thirdhand, and fourthhand from other people. In other words, rumors. The problem of trying to overthrow a president based on this type of evidence is obvious. But that's what their whole case relies on, beginning with secondhand and thirdhand information cited by the whistleblower. That's why on Wednesday, the Democrats were forced to make the absurd argument that hearsay can be much better evidence than direct evidence. And just when you thought the spectacle couldn't get more bizarre, committee Republicans received a memo from the Democrats threatening ethics referrals if we out the whistleblower. As the Democrats are well aware, no Republicans here know the whistleblower's identity because the whistleblower only met with Democrats, not with Republicans. Chairman Schiff claimed not to know who it is, yet he also vowed to block us from asking questions that could reveal his or her identity. Republicans on this committee are left wondering how it's even possible for the chairman to block questions about a person whose identity he claims not to know. The American people may be seeing these absurdities for the first time, but Republicans on this dais are used to them. Until they secretly met with the whistleblower, Democrats showed little interest for the last three years in any topic aside from the ridiculous conspiracy theories that President Trump is a Russian agent. When you find yourself on the phone, like the Democrats did with Russian pranksters offering you nude pictures of Trump, and afterward you order your staff to follow up and get the photos, as the Democrats also did, then it might be time to ask yourself if you've gone out too far on a limb. Even as they were accusing Republicans of colluding with Russians, the Democrats themselves were colluding with Russians by funding the Steele dossier which was based on Russian and Ukrainian sources. Meanwhile, they turn a blind eye to Ukrainians meddling in our elections because the Democrats were cooperating with that operation. This was the subject of a July 20th, 2017 letter sent by Senator Grassley to then Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein. The letter raised concerns about the activities of Alexander Chalupa, a contractor for the Democratic National Committee who worked with Ukrainian embassy officials to spread dirt on the Trump campaign. As Senator Grassley wrote, Chalupa's, action, quote, Chalupa's actions appear to show that she was simultaneously working on behalf of a foreign government, Ukraine, and on behalf of the DNC and the Clinton campaign in an effort to influence not only the U.S. voting population, but U.S. government officials, unquote. 
After touting the Steele dossier and defending the FBI's Russia investigation, which are now being investigated by Inspector General Horowitz and Attorney General Barr, Democrats on this committee ignore Ukrainian election meddling, even though Chalupa publicly admitted to the Democrats' scheme. Likewise, they are blind to the blaring signs of corruption surrounding Hunter Biden's well-paid position on the board of a corrupt Ukrainian company while his father served as vice president and point man for Ukraine issues in the Obama administration. But the Democrats' media hacks only cared about that issue briefly when they were trying to stop Joe Biden from running against Hillary Clinton in 2015. As I previously stated, these hearings should not be occurring at all until we get the answers to three crucial questions the Democrats refuse to ask. First, what is the full extent of the Democrats' prior coordination with the whistleblower, and who else did the whistleblower coordinate this effort with? Second, what is the full extent of Ukraine's election meddling against the Trump campaign? And third, why did Burisma hire Hunter Biden? What did he do for them? And did his position affect any government actions under the Obama administration? I'll note that House Democrats vowed they would not put the American people through a wrenching impeachment process without bipartisan support. And they have none. Add that to their ever-growing list of broken promises and destructive deceptions. In closing, Mr. Chair, the President of the United States released his transcript uh, right before the hearing began. I think it's important that I read this into the record so that there's no confusion over this first phone call that occurred on April 21st with President-elect Zelensky, and I'd like to read it. The President, I'd like to congratulate you on a job well done, and congratulations on a fantastic election. Zelensky, good to hear from you. Thank you so very much. It's nice to hear from you, and I appreciate the congratulations. The President, that was an incredible election. Zelensky, Again, thank you so very much. As you can see, we tried very hard to do our best. We had you as a great example. The President, I think you will do a great job. I have many friends in Ukraine who know you and like you. I have many friends from Ukraine and frankly expected you to win. And it's really an amazing thing that you've done. I guess in a way, I did something similar. We're making tremendous progress in the U.S. We have a, the most tremendous economy ever. I just wanted to congratulate you. I have no doubt you will be a fantastic president. Zelensky, first of all, thank you so very much again for the congratulations. We in Ukraine are an independent country, an independent Ukraine. We're going to do everything for the people. You are, as I said, a great example. We are hoping we can expand on our jobs as you did. You will also be a great example for many. You are a great example for our new managers. I'd also like to invite you, if possible, to the inauguration. I know how busy you are, but if it's possible for you to come to the inauguration ceremony, that would be great. Great for you to do, to be with us on that day. The president, that's very nice. I'll look into that and give us a date. At the very minimum, we'll have a great representative or more from the United States will be with you on that great day. So we will have somebody at a minimum, a very, very high level, and will be with you. Really an incredible day for an incredible achievement. Zelensky, again, thank you. We're looking forward to your visit, to the visit of a high level delegation, but there's no words that can describe our wonderful country, how nice, warm, and friendly our people are, how tasty and delicious our food is, and how wonderful Ukraine is. Words cannot describe our country, so it would be best for you to see it yourself. So if you can come, that would be great. So again, I invite you to come. The President, well, I agree with you about your country, and I look forward to it. When I owned Miss Universe, they always had great people. Ukraine always very well represented, was always very well represented. When you're settled in and ready, I'd like to invite you to the White House. We'll have a lot of things to talk about but we're with you all the way. Zelensky, thank you for the invitation. 
we accept the invitation and look forward to the visit. Thank you again. The whole team and I are looking forward to the visit. Thank you for the congratulations, and I think it will still be great if you could come and be with us on this, be with us on this important day. The results are incredible. They're very impressive for us. So it will be absolutely fantastic if you could come on that day. The president, very good. We'll let you know very soon, and we will see you very, very soon regardless. Congratulations, and please say hello to the Ukrainian people and your family. Let them know I send my best regards. Well, thank you, Zelensky. Well, thank you. You have a safe flight and see you soon. President, take care of yourself and give a great speech today. You take care of yourself and I'll see you soon. Zelensky, thank you very much. It's difficult for me, but I will practice English and I will meet in English. Thank you very much. The president laughing. All oh, that's beautiful to hear. That's really good. I could not do it in your language. I'm very impressed. Thank you so much. Zelensky, thank you so much. The president, good day. Good luck. I'm glad I was able to read that into the record. So the, now the American people know the very first call uh, that President Trump had with President Zelensky. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Mr. Chairman, I have a parliamentary inquiry. Um, the gentleman is not recognized. I'd like to weigh in real quick on what he said in the beginning notes pertaining to this being uh, basically gossip. To determine the difference between gossip and truth determines proof. Proof of it being factual. Once it has become factual, then it is no longer considered hearsay or gossip pertaining to chatter, then it is pertaining to the gospel, the truth. It is pertaining to factual. I think before this is over with, pertaining to these hearings, the American people are going to be able to determine the difference between what has been fabricated towards it being nothing more than a bunch of hokey pokey uh, Gossip versus the facts. When you have this many witnesses that's coming forth, and he never read the second conversation that was the conversation that actually got him in hot water pertaining to his request to the same person that he was talking to, the leader of the Ukrainian government, he never read the second call indicating automatically that you got something to hide. How come you didn't read the second telephone call? You only read the first initial telephone call, which was to break the ice pertaining to the new elected leader that the Ukrainian government or the Ukrainian people just got through electing to run the Ukrainian government. If the American people can't see through that, then they're blind in one eye and can't see out of the other. But let's go on with these proceedings because it's crucial to validate the truth historically referencing in the regard towards historians 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now We'll look back at this and say, wow, this is where they really was with this situation, with this particular, with this particular president. Similar towards how we look at the Nixon trials, or similar how we look at the Clinton trials, or, or the uh, Clinton uh, impeachment uh, uh, hearings. It, it's very, very similar towards how that we look at things today versus how they looked at things then. That's the reason why it's crucial, it's imperative, for us to know the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help us God. Let's listen up.
I do want to comment, uh, and Mr. I'll Chairman, I have a point of order under HRES 660. The gentleman will state her point of order. Uh, the point of order is, will the chairman continue to prohibit witnesses from answering Republican questions as you've done in closed hearings and as you did this week when you interrupted proper, our questions? That is not a proper point of order. The gentleman will, will suspend. Mr. Speaker, Chairman, I, 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 Mr. Chairman, I have a... Uh, yeah. The gentleman is not recognized. Mr. Chairman, I have a point of order. The gentleman is not recognized. I have a point of order, though. The gentleman is not recognized. I do want to respond. I allowed the I ranking member to... Order. I, the gentleman is not recognized. Mr. Chairman, Without, there are four gentlemen scripts that have not been released. The gentleman is not recognized. Holy the ranking cow. member was allowed to exceed the opening statement, and I was happy to allow him to do so. You're not recognized. That means be quiet. I do want to respond to the call record. First of all, I'm grateful that the president has released the call record. I would now ask the president to release the thousands of other records that he has instructed the State Department not to release, including Ambassador Taylor's notes, including Ambassador Taylor's cable, including George Kent's memo, including documents from the Office of Management and Budget about why the military aid was withheld. Mr. Chairman, I want you to release the, the four gentleman is not recognized. You are not recognized. We'll Shut up. Point of order. The gentleman will suspend. Jeep. We would ask the president to stop obstructing the impeachment inquiry. And while we're grateful he has released a single document, he has nonetheless obstructed witnesses and their testimony and the production of thousands and thousands of other records. And finally, I would say this, Mr. President, I hope you'll explain to the country today, today. why it was after this call, and while the Vice President was making plans to attend the inauguration, that you instructed the Vice President not to attend Zelensky's inauguration. Mr. Chairman, today, I have a point today, of order. Mr. General Chairman, I have a point of order. Woman is not recognized. So we know today, clearly you're going woman, to interrupt us throughout this hearing. The woman is not recognized. Mr. Chairman, I have today, a ask for state request. Today, no. Mr. Chairman, I have unanimous The gentleman request. is not, request, not recognized. <clears throat> today we are joined by Ambassador Marie Ivanovich. She was born in Canada to parents who fled the Soviet Union and the Nazis. Ambassador Ivanovich immigrated to Connecticut at three became a naturalized American at 18, and entered the U.S. Foreign Service in 1986. She has served as U.S. Ambassador three times and been nominated by presidents of both parties. Now these are facts. This ain't gossip. This isn't rumors. These are this lady's facts towards what did she has achieved in her life. George W. Bush nominated her to be ambassador to the Kyrgyz Republic where she served from 2005 to 2008. President Obama then nominated her to be U.S. Ambassador to Armenia, where she served from 2008 until 2011. And U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, where she served from 2016 until she was recalled to Washington by President Trump this May. Beyond these ambassadorial posts, she has held numerous other senior positions at the State Department, including in the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs. She served as a dean at the Foreign Service Institute and taught national security strategy at the Defense University. She also previously served at U.S. embassies in Kiev, Ottawa, Moscow, London, and Mogadishu. Ambassador Ivanovich has received multiple honors from the Department for her diplomatic work, including the Presidential Distinguished Service Award and the Secretary's Diplomacy and Human Rights Award. Two final points before our witness is sworn. First witness depositions as part of this inquiry were unclassified in nature and all open hearings will also be held at the unclassified level. Any information that may touch on classified information will be addressed separately. Second, Congress will not tolerate any reprisal, threat of reprisal, or attempt to retaliate against any U.S. government official for testifying before Congress, including you or any of your colleagues. If you would please rise and raise your right hand, I will begin by swearing you in. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record show that the witness has answered in the affirmative. Thank you, and please be seated. Without objection, your written statement will be made part of the record. With that, Ambassador Marie Ivanovich, you are recognized for your opening statement. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Nunez, and other members of the committee, and Ambassador, you'll need to speak very close to the microphone. Thank you for the opportunity to start with this statement, to reintroduce myself to the committee, and to highlight parts of my biography and experience. 
I come before you as an American citizen who has devoted the majority of my life, 33 years, to service to the country that all of us love. love. Like my colleagues, I entered the Foreign Service understanding that my job was to implement the foreign policy interests of this nation as defined by the President and Congress, and to do so regardless of which person or party was in power. I had no agenda other than to pursue our stated foreign policy goals. My service is an expression of gratitude for all that this country has given to me and to my family. My late parents did not have the good fortune to come of age in a free society. My father fled the Soviets before ultimately finding refuge in the United States. My mother's family escaped the USSR after the Bolshevik Revolution, and she grew up stateless in Nazi Germany before also eventually making her way to the United States. Wow. Their personal histories, my personal history, gave me both deep gratitude towards the United States and great empathy for others, like the Ukrainian people who want to be free. Absolutely. I joined the Foreign Service during the Reagan administration and subsequently served three other Republican presidents as well as two Democratic presidents. It was my great honor to be appointed to serve as an ambassador three times, twice by George W. Bush and once by Barack Obama. There is a perception that diplomats lead a comfortable life, uh, throwing dinner parties in fancy homes. Let me tell you about some of my reality. It has not always been easy. I have moved 13 times and served in seven different countries, five of them hardship posts. My first tour was Mogadishu, Somalia, an increasingly dangerous place as that country's civil war kept grinding on and the government was weakening. The military took over policing functions in a particularly brutal way, and basic service, services disappeared. Several years later, after the Soviet Union collapsed, I helped open our embassy in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. As we were establishing relations with a new country, our small embassy was attacked by a gunman who sprayed the embassy building with gunfire. I later served in Moscow. In 1993, during the attempted coup in, Mos in Russia, I was caught in crossfire between presidential and parliamentary forces. It took us three tries, me without a helmet or body armor, to get into a vehicle to go to the embassy. We went because the ambassador asked us to come. And we went because it was our duty. From August 2016 until May 2019, I served as the U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine. During my tenure in Ukraine, I went to the front line approximately 10 times during a hot war to show the American flag, to hear what was going on, sometimes literally as we heard the impact of artillery, and to see how our assistance dollars were being put to use. I worked to advance U.S. policy, fully embraced by Democrats and Republicans alike to help Ukraine become a stable and independent democratic state with a market economy integrated into Europe. A secure, democratic, and free Ukraine serves not just the Ukrainian people, but the American people as well. That's why it was our policy, continues to be our policy, to help the Ukrainians achieve their objectives. They match our object objectives. The U.S. is the most powerful country in the history of the world, in large part because of our values. And our values have made possible the network of alliances and partnerships that buttresses our own strength. Ukraine, with an enormous landmass and a large population, has the potential to be a significant commercial and political partner for the United States, as well as a force multiplier on the security side. We see the potential in Ukraine. Russia sees, by contrast, sees the risk. The history is not written yet, but Ukraine could move out of Russia's orbit. And now Ukraine is a battleground for great power competition, with a hot war for the control of territory and a hybrid war to control Ukraine's leadership. 
The U.S. has provided significant security assistance since the onset of the war against Russia in 2014. And the Trump administration strengthened our policy by approving the provision to Ukraine of anti-tank missiles known as javelins. Supporting Ukraine is the right thing to do. It's also the smart thing to do. If Russia prevails and Ukraine falls to Russian dominion, we can expect to see other attempts by Russia to expand its territory and its influence. As critical as the war against Russia is, Ukraine's struggling democracy has an equally important challenge, battling the Soviet legacy of corruption which has pervaded Ukraine's government. Corruption makes Ukraine's leaders ever vulnerable to Russia, and the Ukrainian people understand that. That's why they launched the Revolution of Dignity in 2014, demanding to be a part of Europe, demanding the transformation of the system, demanding to live under the rule of law. Ukrainians wanted the law to apply equally to all people, whether the individual in question is the president or any other citizen. It was a question of fairness, of dignity. Here again, there is a coincidence of interests. Corrupt leaders are inherently less trustworthy, while an honest and accountable Ukrainian leadership makes a U.S.-Ukrainian partnership more reliable and more valuable to the United States. A level playing field in this strategically located country bordering four NATO allies creates an environment in which U.S. business can more easily trade, invest, and profit. Corruption is also a security issue because corrupt officials are vulnerable to Moscow. In short, it is in America's national security interest to help Ukraine transform into a country where the rule of law governs and corruption is held in check. It was and remains a top U.S. priority to help Ukraine fight corruption, and significant progress has been made since the 2014 Revolution of Dignity. Unfortunately, as the past couple of months have underlined, not all Ukrainians embraced our anti-corruption work. Thus, perhaps it was not surprising that when our anti-corruption efforts got in the way of a desire for profit or power, Ukrainians who prefer to play by the old corrupt rules sought to remove me. What continues to amaze me is that they found Americans willing to partner with them and working together, they apparently succeeded in orchestrating the removal of a U.S. ambassador. How could our system fail like this? How is it that foreign corrupt interests could manipulate our government? Which country's interests are served when the very corrupt behavior we have been criticizing is allowed to prevail. Such conduct undermines the U.S., exposes our friends, and widens the playing field for autocrats like President Putin. And dangers more innocent people's lives towards being against free, open, fair elections pertaining to democracy. That's what it does. It put a it's it puts a stain on independent ambassadors that has reached out across the aisle to fight for this very thing that Ronald Reagan was fighting for towards telling the old USSR that it was a evil empire to tear down that wall and to meet us at the gate telling Brezhnev and Gorbachev these things during Ronald Reagan's administration. All these occurrences that she's talking about, all it does is weaken and stain the very works of democracy. Our leadership depends on the power of our example and the consistency of our purpose. Both have now been opened to question. With that background in mind, I'd like to briefly address some of the factual issues I expect you, you may want to ask me about, starting with my timeline in Ukraine and the events about which I do and do not have firsthand knowledge. 
I arrived in Ukraine on August 22nd, 2016, and left Ukraine permanently on May 20th, 2019. There are a number of events you are investigating to which I cannot bring any first-hand knowledge. The events that predated my Ukraine service include the release of the so-called Black Ledger and Mr. Manafort's subsequent resignation from President Trump's campaign, and the departure from office of former Prosecutor General Viktor Shokhin. Several other events occurred after I returned from Ukraine. These include President Trump's July 25th, 2019 call with President Zelensky, the discussions surrounding that phone call, and any discussions surrounding the delay of security assistance to Ukraine in the summer of 2019. As for events during my tenure in Ukraine, I want to, re to reiterate first that the allegation that I disseminated a do not prosecute list was a fabrication. Mr. Lutsenko, the former Ukrainian prosecutor general who made that allegation, has acknowledged that the list never existed. I did not tell Mr. Lutsenko or other Ukrainian officials who they should or should not prosecute. Instead, I advocated the U.S. position that rule of law should prevail and Ukrainian law enforcement, prosecutors, and judges should stop wielding their power selectively as a political weapon against their adversaries and start dealing with all consistently and according to the law. Also untrue are unsourced allegations that I told unidentified embassy employees or Ukrainian officials that President Trump's orders should be ignored because he was going to be impeached or for any other reason. I did not, and I would not say such a thing. Such statements would be inconsistent with my training as a Foreign Service Officer and my role as an Ambassador. The Obama administration did not ask me to help the, the Clinton campaign or harm the Trump campaign, nor would I have taken any such steps if they had. Partisanship of this type is not compatible with the role of a career Foreign Service Officer. I have never met Hunter Biden, nor have I had any direct or indirect conversations with him. And although I have met former Vice President Biden several times over the course of our many years in government service, neither he nor the previous administration ever raised the issue of either Burisma or Hunter Biden with me. With respect to Mayor Giuliani, I have had only minimal contact with him, a total of three, none related to the events at issue. I do not understand Mr. Giuliani's motives for attacking me, nor can I offer an opinion on whether he believed the allegations he spread about me. Clearly, no one at the State Department did. What I can say is that Mr. Giuliani should have known those claims were suspect, coming as they reportedly did from individuals with questionable motives and with reason to believe that their political and financial ambitions would be stymied by our anti-corruption policy in Ukraine. <clears throat> After being asked by the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs in early March 2019 to extend my tour until 2020, the smear campaign against me entered a new public phase in the United States. In the wake of the negative press, State Department officials suggested an earlier departure and we agreed upon July 2019. I was then abruptly told just weeks later in late April, to come back to Washington from Ukraine on the next plane. At the time I departed, Ukraine had just concluded game-changing presidential elections. It was a sensitive period with much at stake for the United States and called for all the experience and expertise we could muster. When I returned to the United States, Deputy Secretary of State Sullivan told me there had been a concerted campaign against me that the president no longer wished me to serve as ambassador to Ukraine, and that in fact, the president had been pushing for my removal since the prior summer. As Mr. Sullivan recently recounted during his Senate confirmation hearing, neither he nor anyone else ever explained or sought to justify the president's concerns about me, nor did anyone in the department justify my early departure by suggesting I had done something wrong. I appreciate that Mr. Sullivan publicly affirmed at his hearing that I had served capably and admirably. 
Although then and now, I have always understood that I served at the pleasure of the President, I still find it difficult to comprehend that foreign and private interests were able to undermine U.S. interests in this way. Individuals who apparently felt stymied by our efforts to promote stated U.S. policy against corruption, that is, to do our mission, were able to successfully conduct a campaign of disinformation against a sitting ambassador using unofficial back channels. As various witnesses have recounted, they shared baseless allegations with the President and convinced him to remove his ambassador, despite the fact that the State Department fully understood that the allegations were false and the sources highly suspect. These events should concern everyone in this room. Ambassadors are the symbol of the United States abroad. They are the personal representative of the President. They should always act and speak with full authority to advocate for U.S. policies. If our chief representative is kneecapped, it limits our effectiveness to safeguard the vital national security interests of the United States. Right. This is especially important now. Right. When the international landscape is more complicated and more competitive than it has been since the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Right. Our Ukraine policy has been thrown into disarray. And shady interests the world, the world over have learned how little it takes to remove an American ambassador who does not give them what they want. After these events, what foreign official, corrupt or not, could be blamed for wondering whether the U.S. ambassador represents the president's views? And what U.S. ambassador could be blamed for harboring the fear that they can't count on our government to support them as they implement stated U.S. policy? and protect and defend U.S. interests. In other words, for the president to have their backs. I'd like to comment on one other matter before taking your questions. At the closed deposition, I expressed grave concerns about the degradation of the Foreign Service over the past few years and the failure of State Department leadership to push back as foreign and corrupt interests apparently hijacked our Ukraine policy. I remain disappointed that the department's leadership and others have declined to acknowledge that the attacks against me and others are dangerously wrong. I would use the word sabotage more so than hijack, but I guess hijack's a good word. This is about far, far, far more than me or a couple of individuals. As foreign service professionals are being denigrated and undermined, the institution is also being degraded. Right. This will soon cause real harm if it hasn't already. The State Department as a tool of foreign policy often doesn't get the same kind of attention or even respect as the military might of the Pentagon. That's right. But we are, as they say, the pointy end of the spear. That's right. If we lose our edge, the U.S. will inevitably have to use other tools even more than it does today. They are the grunts. They are the Minutemen. They are the people that you don't see on the shelf. In other words, you got to show horses, then you got to work horses. What she's describing right now is that she's one of the work horses. And those other tools are blunter, more expensive. And they are. And not universally effective. Moreover, the attacks are leading to a crisis in the State Department as the policy process is visibly unraveling. Leadership vacancies go unfilled and senior and mid-level officers ponder an uncertain future. The crisis has moved from the impact on individuals to an impact on the institution itself. The State Department is being hollowed out from within at a competitive and complex time on the world stage. This is not a time to undercut our diplomats. It is the responsibility of the department's leaders to stand up for the institution and the individuals who make that institution still today the most effective diplomatic force in the world. And Congress has a responsibility to reinvest in our diplomacy. That's an investment in our national security. It's an investment in our future, in our children's future. As I close, let me be clear on who we are and how we serve this country. 
We are professionals. We are pu public servants who, by vocation and training, pursue the policies of the president, regardless of who holds that office or what party they affiliate with. We handle American citizen services, facilitate trade and commerce, work security issues, represent the U.S., and report to and advise Washington to mention just some of our functions. And we make a difference every day. Every day. We are people who repeatedly uproot our lives, who risk and sometimes give our lives for this country. Yes. We are the 52 Americans who 40 years ago this month began 444 days of deprivation, torture, and captivity in Tehran. We are the dozens of Americans stationed at our embassy in Cuba and consulates in China who mysteriously and dangerously, and in some cases perhaps even permanently, were injured and attacked from unknown sources several years ago. And we are Ambassador Chris Stevens, Sean Patrick Smith, Ty Woods, and Glenn Doherty, people rightly called heroes for their ultimate sacrifice to this nation's foreign policy yes. interests in Libya yes. eight years ago. Yes. We honor these individuals. They represent each one of you here and every American. Yes. These courageous individuals were attacked because they symbolized America. What you need to know, what Americans need to know, is that while thankfully most of us answer the call to duty in far less dramatic ways, every Foreign Service officer runs the same risks, and very often so do our families. Right. They serve too. Right. As individuals, as a community, right. we answer the call to duty to advance and protect the interests of the United States. Right. We take our oath seriously, the same oath that each one of you take to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, Absolutely. and to bear true faith and allegiance to the same. I count myself lucky to be a Foreign Service officer, fortunate to serve with the best America has to offer, blessed to serve the American people for the last 33 years. I thank you for your attention. I welcome your questions. Everything that that lady just got to saying is the gospel pertaining to it being the truth of the positions that our ambassadors hold representing the American people. Just like our spiritual ambassadors pertaining to people like Billy Graham. Um, these people put their necks on the line too as well, that ordinarily does not have to worry about domestic abuse towards their own homeland attacking them, similar towards how the Windmill Ministries here at 291 Thompson Road, Sharon, Tennessee, zip code 38255, was attacked in the past previous four and a half, now going on five years. Now, does that mean that I am scot-free towards some idiot or some malicious group or some sort of gang activity or somebody out of his mind driving by and doing a drive-by or deliberately wanting to bring havoc to this ministry that supports everything that not only our Constitution supports, but supports everything pertaining to the King James? Does this mean that I am exempt from any type of attacks or pain or agony or sorrow or misery coming from my own people? Obviously not, because if it was, I would not have, a, David and I would not have received the type of animosity and resistance that we received since I come back here in 2014. The same way that this woman and other ambassadors is receiving scrutiny from their own people in various departments of the government. This is 
this is not good. This is like a mutiny that has been formed within the own, within our own democracy or within our own country here in the United States because we know the bottom line. We know what the principles was to stand for and what we was supposed to have sworn off in doing according to previous administrations and previous ambassadors and previous ministers who have stood up for the Word of God or stood up for free, open, fair democracy. We know. And to be treated this way is just absolutely appalling. It's appalling that this woman, first of all, got treated the way that she got treated by our own chief and commander towards him basically threatening her and telling her to pick up stakes and leave immediately and that something was going to happen to her. You know, we're dealing with a president here in our country that has done the next thing of putting out some sort of a contract on the whistleblower. And you really can't blame a lot of people for being frightened to death towards not wanting to stand up and do the right patriotic thing due to the fact that whenever you have a chief and commander, a president of the United States people that is willing to rule under this type of tyranny similar of a mobster. A mobster puts out orders against their own people that if you don't do something a certain, certain way, I'm coming after you and I'm coming after your family. That's mobster tactics. That's not American tactics. Especially if you're attacking the people that's supposed to be representing the people. That's counterproductive. That's what these hearings is about, and that's what the American people are going to get to the bottom of. Because it is so, so sad whenever so much work, time, and sacrifices has been made to get the Ukrainians where they are today in comparison to where they was whenever the wall first fell 30 years ago. 30 years ago. They didn't have, as the old saying goes, they didn't have a snowball chance in hell until our president, Ronald Reagan, stood up against that type of tyranny and said, what you people are doing in Russia is evil to your own people. Stop doing it. It wasn't until then that the Ukrainians or a certain group from the old USSR had an opportunity towards breaking away and forming their own established government. Up until then, they was doomed. They was doomed. Similar towards how the people are right now over in Hong Kong. They're doomed whenever it comes to having free open enterprise, free open fair elections, having a constitution that allows for them to be able to speak, such as I am speaking and she is speaking and others are going to speak throughout this hearing. These are sacrifices that has been made in the past that has resorted to in lots of incidences towards it being the ultimate sacrifice. You keep in mind whenever our ancestors stood up against King George, what was it, King George III or something like that, uh, during the Revolutionary War, they put their lives on the line and a lot of them had to sacrifice the ultimate sacrifice for us to have our constitution that we have today, for our democracy to be as it's supposed to be today. And you're not supposed to be attacked because you're standing up for good. You're not supposed to be attacked because you're standing up 
towards being an anti-corruption uh, entity. You're not supposed to be attacked because you're standing up for the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You're not supposed to be attacked because you want peace and utopia and you want things to be better in society. But that's exactly what has went on here with the founder of the Windmill Ministries since I have come back here in 2014. And people like Tommy Moore, the judge, the residing judge here in Weekly County, can verify this. And other officials in this area can verify this because the record speaks for itself. It's undeniable. It's absolutely undeniable. Judge Pence and other judges throughout these little rink-a-dink towns around here can verify what I'm talking about is, in fact, factual. And this isn't, this isn't some sort of uh, gossip. I can prove, I can validate through records and through testimony, and on various CDs, Facebook uh, platforms, as well as YouTube platforms, I can validate the various statements that I'm making right now. Once you put stuff out on the internet pertaining to the cloud, once you put pictures out or you put statements out there, it doesn't go away. It doesn't get erased. The people that come out here and cut this windmill ministry sign down, that vandalize this property, that tore down a mailbox, which is a federal offense, that tore the peace sign off of the cross, that tore up two rocking chairs, that wasn't doing nothing but just sitting there minding their own business on the porch. The people that done that thought that they could eliminate or eradicate the windmill ministry's missions by doing that. And the thing about it is there's already been so many, so much documentation about the windmill ministry sign, about the, the peace that, that went up and down on the broken cross. There was so many pictures and so many documentations. I don't care if you destroy a thousand signs. You're not going to be able to destroy the data in the computer base that is now reached up into the cloud pertaining to it being stored up in various satellites that has now probably reached places all over the world. So it just shows you the ignorance of whoever it was that tore down the sign that wanted to eradicate the thought or the ideal of peace that come out here and done this type of damage that vandalized this property the way that they did. It just shows you their ignorance and their mind concept in thinking that they was going to be able to erase or eliminate or eradicate whatever, word, whatever terminology that you wanted to use of the stance of the windmill ministries that has now been out into the eyes of the general public going on 30 some odd years. Since 1988 is whenever it become established towards walking out into the eyes of the general public. And I'm sure the ideology behind Donald Trump towards wanting to basically fire her or get her out of the Ukraine area had similar type motives in thinking, well, if I can get her out of there and make life tough for her, we'll eliminate this problem. Thing about it is, she's not the problem. It's the chief and commander that was doing the ordering that was the problem because he had some other hidden agenda along with him and his attorney, Rudy, Judy, Giuliani, and other people that was involved 
in this type of underhand manip manipulating scheme of doing whatever that they was doing to the Ukrainian newly elected president. This is deep, folks. This is deep, and this is pertaining to our freedom. This is pertaining to our democracy. This is pertaining to who we are. This is pertaining to great, not just emotional sacrifices, but financial sacrifices, and in some degree, even life sacrifices have been made on account of these dreams, ideals, visions that our ancestors had going back 240 years ago. Please do not take none of this lightly in the year 20 and 19 of these impeachment hearings of the attempts of removing an ambassador lightly. Please do not take none of this in a lightly form. These are serious, serious moments that we're dealing with that could actually jeopardize our own well-beings throughout the planet, throughout other nations and other countries. Let's listen to some more of this. I had to throw that in. It, it, this emotionally is so heart-wrenching and so heartbreaking to watch this. Thank you, Ambassador. We count ourselves lucky to have you serve the country uh, as you have for decades. Absolutely. We'll now move to the 45-minute rounds. I recognize myself and Majority Council for 45 minutes. Ambassador Ivanovich, thank you again for appearing today. All Americans are deeply in your debt. Before I hand it over to and Mr. Right, Coleman, so. Council, I want to ask you about a few of the pivotal events of interest to the country. Uh, first of all, was fighting corruption in Ukraine a key element of U.S. policy and one on which you placed the highest priority? Yes, it was. And can you explain why? It was important, um, and it was actually stated in, 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 our, um, in our policy and in our strategy. It was important because uh, corruption was undermining uh, the integrity of the governance, uh, governance system in Ukraine. And as I noted in my statement, countries uh, that have uh, leaders uh, that are honest and trustworthy make better partners for us. Uh, countries uh, where there is a level playing field for our U.S. business um, makes it easier for our companies to, uh, to do business there, to trade and to profit in those countries. And um, what had been happening since the Soviet Union, and this is very much a Soviet legacy, is that corrupt interests were undermining not only the governance but also the economy of, of Ukraine. We see enormous potential in Ukraine and would like to have a more capable, more trustworthy partner there. And I know this may be awkward for you to answer since it's a question about yourself and your reputation, but is it fair to say that you earned a reputation for being a champion of anti-corruption efforts in Ukraine? Yes, yes. I don't know if you had a chance to watch uh, George Kent's testimony yesterday, but would you agree with his rather frank assessment that if you fight corruption, you're going to piss off some corrupt people. Yes. Absolutely. And in your efforts fighting corruption to advance U.S. policy interests, did you anger some of the corrupt leaders in Ukraine? Yes. Absolutely. Was one of those corrupt people Prosecutor General Yuri Litsenko? Yes, I believe so. Absolutely. Was another one of those corrupt people Litsenko's predecessor, another corrupt Prosecutor General named Viktor Shokin? A apparently so, although I've never met him. Absolutely. At some point, did you come to learn that both Letsenko and Shokin were in touch with Rudy Giuliani, President Trump's lawyer and representative? Yes. Absolutely. In fact, uh, did Giuliani try to overturn a decision that you participated in to deny Shokin a visa? Yes, that is what I was told. And that denial was based on Mr. Shokin's corruption? Yes, that's true. There you go. 
And was it Mr. Lutsenko, among others, who coordinated with Mr. Giuliani to peddle false accusations against you as well as the Bidens? Yes, that is my understanding. There you go. And were these smears also amplified by the president's son, Donald Trump Jr., as well as certain hosts on Fox? Yes, yes, that is the case. In the face of this smear campaign, did colleagues at the State Department try to get a statement of support for you from Secretary Pompeo? Yes. Were they successful? No. Did you come to learn that they couldn't issue such a statement because they feared it would be undercut by the president? Yes. Feared. And then were you told that though you had done nothing wrong, you did not enjoy the confidence of the president and could no longer serve as ambassador? Yes, that is correct. And in fact, you flew home from Kiev on the same day as the inauguration of Ukraine's new president? That's true. Wow. That inauguration was attended by three who have become known as the Three Amigos, Ambassador Sondland, Volker, and Perry, was it? Yes. And three days after that inauguration, in a meeting with President Trump, are you aware that the president designated these Three Amigos to coordinate Ukraine policy with Rudy Giuliani? Since then, I've become aware of that. There you go. This is the same Rudy Giuliani who orchestrated the smear campaign against you? Yes. Uh, and the same Rudy Giuliani who, during the now infamous July 25th phone call, the president recommended to Zelensky in the context of the two investigations the president wanted into the 2016 election and the Bidens? Yes. And finally, Ambassador, in that July 25th phone call, the president praises one of these corrupt former Ukrainian prosecutors and says they were treated very unfairly. They were treated unfairly. Not you, who was smeared and recalled, but one of them. What message does that send to your colleagues in the U.S. Embassy in Kiev? I'm just not sure what the basis for that kind of a statement would be. Certainly not from our reporting over years. Did you have concern, though, or do you have concern today about what message the president's action sends to the people who are still in Ukraine representing the United States when a well-respected ambassador can be smeared out of her post um, with the participation and acquiescence of the president of the United States? Well, it's, uh, I think, been a, a big hit for morale, uh, both at U.S. Embassy Kyiv, um, but also more broadly uh, in the State Department. It sends a negative message. That's the kind of message that it sends. It sends a message that something has went wrong. Something is not right. What is going on here? That's the message that it sends to those people. Is it fair to say that other ambassadors and others of lesser rank who serve the United States and embassies around the world might look at this and think, if I take on corrupt people in these countries, that could happen to me? I think that's a fair statement, yes. Fear. And we're not supposed to operate in our democracy under fear. Plus, the fact of the matter is, she was doing her job. She was doing, she was policing that situation over there. That was what she was supposed to have been doing, was policing. And for her to get reprimanded, punished, penalized, chastised, ridiculed by the chief and commander of this country, uh, that speaks volumes about what's actually going on here. It's sad. It is Horribly sad. Frightening sad. Sobering sad. Mr. Goldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ambassador Ivanovich, on April 24th of this year, at approximately 10 p.m., you received a telephone call while you were at the embassy in Kiev 
from the Director General of the State Department. This was just three days after President Zelensky's election and the call between <coughs> President Trump and President Zelensky that we just heard from Ranking Member Nunez. At the time that this urgent call came in, what were you in the middle of doing? I was hosting an event uh, in honor of Katya Hanzuk, who is an anti-corruption activist, was an anti-corruption activist in Ukraine. Uh, we had given her um, the um, Woman of Courage Award uh, from Ukraine, and in fact, uh, the Worldwide uh, Woman of Courage event at the Worldwide uh, Women of Courage event in Washington, D.C., Secretary Pompeo uh, singled her out uh, for her amazing work in, in Ukraine to fight corrupt interests in the, in the south of, of Ukraine. She very tragically died because she was attacked by acid and uh, several months later died a, a, a very, very painful death. We thought it was important uh, that justice be done for Katya Hansiuk and for others who fight corruption in Ukraine, because this is, it's not a, you know, kind of a tabletop exercise there. Uh, lives are in the balance. And um, so we uh, wanted to bring attention to this. We held an event um, and gave her father, who of course is still mourning her, uh, that, uh, that award, the Women of Courage event. And her Cur Women of Courage award stemmed from her anti-corruption efforts in Ukraine? Yes, that is true. Was it ever determined who threw the acid and, and killed her? There have been investigations, but um, uh, while uh, some of the lower ranking individuals that um, were involved in this uh, have been arrested, those who ordered uh, this have not yet been apprehended. After you stepped away from this anti-corruption event to take this call, what did the director general tell you? She said that there was uh, great concern on the seventh floor of the State Department. That's where the leadership of the State Department sits. There was great concern. Uh, they were worried. Um, she just wanted to give me a heads up about this. Um, and, you know, things seemed to be going on. And so she just wanted to give me a heads up. I, you know, it's hard to know how to react to something like that. I asked her what it was about. Uh, what did she think it was about? Uh, she didn't know. She said that she was going to try and find out more, but she had wanted to um, give me a heads up. In fact, I think she may even have been instructed uh, to give me a heads up on that. And so I asked her, you know, kind of what is the next step here? So she said she would try to uh, find out more and she would try to call me um, by midnight. What happened next? Uh, around one o'clock uh, in, uh, in the morning, uh, she called me again and she said that um, there were great concerns, um, there were concerns up the street, and she um, said I needed to get on the home, come home immediately, get on the next plane um, to the U.S., um, and I asked her why, <laughs> and she said she wasn't sure, but there were concerns about my security. I asked her my physical security, because sometimes Washington knows more than we do about these things, and she said no, she hadn't gotten that impression that it was a physical uh, security issue, but they were concerned about my security and I needed to come home right away. Um, you know, I argued uh, this is extremely irregular and, um, and no reason given. Uh, but in the end, um, I, I did get on the next plane home. You said you, there were concerns up the street. What did you understand that to mean? The White House. Did she explain in any more detail what she meant by concerns about your security? No, uh, she didn't. I, I did specifically ask whether this had to do with um, the um, Mayor Giuliani's um, allegations against me and so forth, and she said she didn't know. Um, it didn't even actually appear to me that she seemed to be aware of that. Um, no, no, no reason was offered. Did she explain what the urgency was for you to come back on the next flight? Uh, the only thing that's pertinent to that was that when she said that there were, there were concerns about my security, that's all. But it was not further explained. Now, prior to this abrupt call back to Washington, D.C., had you been offered an extension of your post by the State Department? Yes, uh, Undersecretary, uh, the Undersecretary for Political Affairs 
had asked whether I would extend for another, uh, another year, uh, departing in July of 2020. When was that request made? Uh, in early March. So about a month and a half before this call? Yes. Did anyone at the State Department ever express concerns about your job performance? No. Now, after you returned to Washington a couple days after that, you met with the Deputy Secretary of State. And at your deposition, you said that the De Deputy Secretary of State told you that you had done nothing wrong, but that there was a concerted campaign against you. What did, what did he mean by that? I'm not exactly sure, uh, but I took it to mean uh, that uh, the allegations that Mayor Giuliani and others uh, were putting out there, that that's, that that's what it was. And who else was involved in this concerted campaign against you? Um, there were some members of, uh, of the press and others in Mayor Giuliani's circle. And who from Ukraine? Uh, in Ukraine, uh, I think, uh, well, Mr. Lutsenko, uh, the Prosecutor General, uh, and Mr. Shokin, his, his predecessor, uh, certainly. And at this time, Mr. Lutsenko was the lead Prosecutor General, is that right? Yes, that's correct. And had President Zelensky indicated whether or not he was going to keep him on after the election? Uh, he had indicated he would not be keeping on Mr. Lutsenko. And I believe you testified earlier that Mr. Lutsenko had a, a reputation as, for being corrupt, is that right? That's correct. Now, during this conversation, did the Deputy Secretary tell you about your future as the ambassador to Ukraine? Well, he told me I needed to leave. What did he say? Um, he said that, um, I mean, there was a lot of back and forth, but ultimately he said uh, the words that, you know, every Foreign Service under uh, officer understands, the President has lost confidence in you. That was, you know, a terrible thing to hear. And, um, and I said, well, you know, I guess I have to go then. Um, but no, no real reason was offered as to why I had to leave and why it was being done in such a manner. Did you have any indication that the State Department had lost confidence in you? No. And were you provided any reason why the President lost confidence in you? No. Now, you testified at your deposition that you were told at some point that Secretary Pompeo had tried to protect you, but that he was no longer able to do that. Were you aware of these efforts to protect you? No, I was not until, um, until that uh, meeting with uh, Deputy Secretary Sullivan. And were you, did you understand who he was trying to protect you from? Well, my understanding was that um, the president had wanted me to leave, and there was some discussion about that over the prior months. <clears throat> Did you have any understanding why Secretary Pompeo was no longer able to protect you? No, it was just a statement made that he was no longer able to protect me. So just like that, you had to leave Ukraine as soon as possible? Yes. How did that make you feel? Terrible, honestly. Um, I mean, after 33 years of service to our country, um, it was terrible. It's not the way I wanted my career to end. Now, you also told this Deputy Secretary that this was a dangerous precedent. What did you mean by that? I was worried, I was worried about our policy, but also personnel. That, and I asked him, how, how are you going to explain this to uh, people in the State Department, the press, the public, um, the Ukrainians, uh, because everybody is watching. And so if people see somebody who, uh, and, and of course it had been very public, uh, the, uh, frankly, the attacks on me by Mayor Giuliani and others, and Mr. Lutsenko in Ukraine, if people see that I, who have been um, you know, promoting our policies uh, on anti-corruption, uh, if they can undermine me and get me pulled out of Ukraine, 
What does that mean for our policy? Do we still have that same policy? How are we going to affirmatively put that forward, number one? Number two, uh, when other countries, other actors in other countries see that um, private interests, foreign interests uh, can come together and uh, get a U.S. ambassador removed, what's going to stop them from doing that in the future in other countries? Uh, often, uh, the work we do, we try to be diplomatic about it, but as uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary George Kent said, uh, you know, sometimes we get people really angry with us. It's uncomfortable. And um, we are doing our jobs, uh, but sometimes people become very angry with us. And if What she's talking about here is an international threat or concern to our policies in regard to our allies that are all over the world. She's talking about upsetting the apple cart or dismantling common known practices that has been inserted into peace conference alliances for the past probably since World War II. It is sad that it has come to this in these regards. If they realize that they can just remove us, uh, they're going to do that. How did the Deputy Secretary respond? He, he said those were good questions and um, he would get back to me. Did he ever get back to you? He asked to see me the following day. What did he say to you then? Uh, he really, the conversation was more, um, and you know, again, I'm grateful for this, but really more to see how I was doing, um, and, uh, you know, what would I do next, uh, kind of, uh, how, how could he help? But he didn't address the dangerous precedent that you flagged for him? No. Now, you understood, of course, that the President of the United States could remove you and that you served at the pleasure of the president, is that right? That's right. <laughs> but in your 33 years as a foreign service officer, have you ever heard of a president of the United States recalling another ambassador without cause based on allegations that the State Department itself knew to be false? No. Now you testified in your opening statement that you had left Ukraine by the time of the July 25th call between President Trump and President Zelensky. When was the first time that you saw the call record for this phone call? When it was released publicly at the end of September, I believe. And prior to reading that call record, were you aware that President Trump had specifically made reference to you in that call? No. What was your reaction to learning that? I was shocked. Absolutely shocked and, and devastated, frankly. What do you mean by devastated? I was shocked and devastated that um, I would feature in a phone call between two heads of state uh, in such a manner uh, where um, President Trump said that I was bad news to another world leader uh, and that I would be going through some things. Um, so I was, it, it was, it was a terrible moment. Uh, a person who saw me actually reading the transcript said that the color drained from my face. I think I even had a physical reaction. Um, I, I think, you know, even now words kind of fail me. Well, uh, without upsetting you too much, I'd like to show you the excerpts um, from the call. And the first one, where President Trump says, <clears throat> the former ambassador from the United States, the woman, was bad news. 
and the people she was dealing with in the Ukraine were bad news. So I just want to let you know. What was your reaction when you heard the President of the United States refer to you as bad news? I couldn't believe it. I mean, again, shocked, appalled, devastated that um, the President of the United States would talk about any ambassador uh, like that um, to a foreign uh, head of state. <laughs> and it was me. I, I mean, I couldn't believe it. The next excerpt, when the pre President references you, is a short one. But he said, well, she's going to go through some things. What did you think when President Trump told President Zelensky and you read that you were going to go through some things? I didn't know what to think, um, but I was very concerned. What were you concerned about? She's going to go through some things. It didn't sound good. It sounded like a threat. Did you feel threatened? I did. How so? I, I didn't know exactly. It's not, you know, a very precise phrase, but I think um, it, it, it didn't feel like I was, uh, I, I really don't know how, how to answer the question any further except to say that uh, it kind of felt like a vague threat. And so I wondered what that meant. It concerned me. Now, in this same call where the president, as you just said, threatens you to a foreign leader, he also pra pra praises, rather, the corrupt Ukrainian prosecutor who led the false smear campaign against you. I want to show you another excerpt or two from the transcript, or the call record, rather, where the president of the United States says, good, because I heard you had a prosecutor who was very good and he was shut down and that's really unfair. A lot of people are talking about that. The way they shut your very good prosecutor down and you had some very bad people involved. And he went on later to say, I heard the prosecutor was treated very badly and he was a very fair prosecutor. So good luck with everything. Now, Ambassador Ivanovich, after nearly three years in Ukraine where you tried to clean up the Prosecutor General's office, was it the U.S. Embassy's view that the former Prosecutor General was a very good and very fair prosecutor? No, it was not. And in fact, he was rather corrupt, is that right? That was our belief. The Prosecutor General's office is a long-running problem in Ukraine, is that right? Yes. So how did you feel when you heard President Trump speak so highly of the corrupt Ukrainian prosecutor who helped to execute the smear campaign to have you removed? Well, it was, it was disappointing. It was concerning. Um, it wasn't certainly based on anything that the State Department would have reported or frankly, anybody else in the US government. Uh, there was a, an interagency consensus that while uh, when Mr. Lutsenko came into office, we were very hopeful that he would actually do the things that he said he would set out to do, including uh, reforming the Prosecutor General's office, uh, but that did not materialize. So this was not the uniform position of the official U.S. policymakers, is that right? Right. Now let's go back to the smear campaign that you referenced and in March when you said it became public. And you previously testified that you had learned that Rudy Giuliani, President Trump's lawyer and, and representative, who was also mentioned in that July 25th call, was in regular communication with the corrupt prosecutor general in late 2018 and, and early 2019. And at one point in your deposition, you said that they that being Giuliani and the corrupt foreign uh, prosecutor general, had plans to, quote, do things to me. What did you mean by that? Uh, I, didn't, I didn't really know, but that's what I had been told by Ukrainian officials.
Did you subsequently understand a little bit more what that meant? Well, you know, now with the advantage of hindsight, I think that meant removing me from my job in Ukraine. Who did you understand to be working with Mr. Giuliani as his associates in Ukraine? Well, certainly Mr. Lutsenko, Mr. Shokin. I believe that there were also Ukrainian Americans, Mr. Parnas and Mr. Fruman, who have recently been indicted. Those are the two who have been indicted in New York? Southern District of New York. Now, at the end of March, this effort by Giuliani and his associates resulted in a series of articles in the Hill publication that were based on allegations in part from Lutsenko, the corrupt prosecutor general. And just to summarize some of these allegations, there were, among others, three different categories. One category included the attacks against you, which you referenced in your opening statement, including that you had badmouthed the president and had given the prosecutor general a do not prosecute list. There was another that included allegations of Ukrainian interference in the 2016 election. And then there was a third that related to allegations concerning Burisma and the Bidens. Is that accurate? Yeah. Yes. Were these articles and allegations then promoted by others associated with the president in the United States? They seem to be promoted by those around Mayor Giuliani. I'm going to show you a couple of exhibits, including a tweet here by President Trump himself on March 20th, which was the first day that one of these articles was published. It appears to be a quote that says, John Solomon is the author of the articles, colon, as Russia collusion fades, Ukrainian plot to help Clinton emerges, unquote, at Sean Hannity at Fox News. And then if I could go to another tweet four days later, this is the president's son, Donald Trump Jr., who tweets, we need more at Richard Grinnell's, who's the ambassador to Germany, is that right? That's correct. And less of these jokers as ambassadors. And it's a retweet of one of John Solomon's articles or an article referencing the allegations that says calls grow to remove Obama's U.S. ambassador to Ukraine. Were you aware of these tweets at the time? Yes. What was your reaction to seeing this? Well, I was worried. What were you worried about? That this didn't seem these attacks were, you know, being repeated by the president himself and and his son. And were you aware whether they received attention on primetime television on Fox News as well? Yes, I did. Now, was the allegation that you were bad mouthing President Trump true? No. Was the allegation that you had created a do not prosecute list to give to the prosecutor general in Ukraine true? No. In fact, didn't the corrupt prosecutor general himself later recant those allegations? Yes. Now, when these articles were first published, did the State Department issue a response? As you said, there was a series of articles. So after the first article, which was an interview with Mr. Lutsenko and was only really about me and made certain allegations about me, the State Department came out the following day with a very strong statement saying that, you know, these these allegations were fabrications. So the statement addressed the falsity of the allegations themselves? Yes. It didn't say anything about your job performance in any way? You know, honestly, I haven't looked at it in a very long time. I think it was generally probably laudatory, but I can't recall. Did anyone in the State Department raise any concerns with you or express any belief in these allegations? No. I mean, people thought it was ridiculous. Now, after these false allegations were made against you, did you have any discussions with anyone in leadership in the State Department about a potential 
statement of support from the department or the secretary himself? Yes, after um, the, the tweets that, that you uh, just showed us, um, I mean, it seemed to me that uh, if um, the president's son is, is um, uh, saying things like this, that it would be very hard to continue in my position and have authority in Ukraine uh, unless the State Department came out pretty strongly behind me. And so, uh, you know, over, <clears throat> over the weekend of uh, like March 22nd, I think that's about the date, um, there was a lot of discussion on email uh, among um, a, a number of people about what could, what could be done. Uh, I um, and um, Undersecretary, the Undersecretary for Political Affairs called me on, on Sunday and I, I said, you know, it's really important that the Secretary himself come out and be supportive because otherwise it's hard for me to be the kind of representative you need here. Um, and he said he would talk to the secretary. I mean, that was, that's my recollection of the call. That may not be exactly how it played out, but that was the, 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 my recollection. This is um, David Hale, the undersecretary of political affairs, is the number three person at the State Department? Yes. Did he indicate to you that he supported such a, a statement of support for you? I think he must have, because I don't think he would have gone to the secretary if he, if he didn't support it. I mean, you wouldn't bring a bad idea to the secretary of state. Your general understanding is that you did have the full support of the State Department, is that right? Yes. And in fact, during your 33 year career as a foreign service officer, did you ever hear of any serious concerns about your job performance? No. Was this statement of support ultimately issued for you? No, it was not. Did you learn why not? Yeah, uh, yes. I was uh, told that there was a concern on the seventh floor that if a statement of support was issued, uh, whether by the State Department or uh, by the Secretary personally, that it could be undermined. How would it, could it be undermined? that the president might uh, issue a, a tweet contradicting that or something to that effect. So let me see if I get this right. You were one of the most senior diplomats in the State Department. You've been there for 33 years. You've won numerous awards. You've been appointed as an ambassador three times by both Republican and Democratic presidents. And the State Department would not issue a statement in support of you against false allegations because they were concerned about a tweet from the President of the United States? That's my understanding. Mr. Coleman, if I could follow up on that question, it seems like an appropriate time. Um, Ambassador Ivanovich, uh, as we sit here testifying, the President is attacking you on Twitter. Um, and I'd like to give you a chance to respond. I'll read part of one of his tweets. Everywhere Marie Ivanovich went turned bad. She started off in Somalia. How did that go? Uh, he goes on to say uh, later in the tweet is that U.S. President's absolute right to appoint ambassadors. First of all, uh, Ambassador Ivanovich, the Senate has a chance to confirm or deny an ambassador, do they not? Yes, advise and consent. But would you like to respond to the president's attack that everywhere you went turned bad? Well, I, I mean, I don't, I don't think I have such powers, uh, not in Mogadishu, Somalia, Somalia, not in other places. I actually think that um, where I've served over the years, um, I and others have demonstrably um, made things better, you know, for the U.S. as well as for the countries uh, that I've served in. Uh, Ukraine, for example, where there are huge challenges, including, you know, on the issue that we're discussing today of, of corruption, huge challenges. But they've made a lot of progress since 2014, including in the years that I was there. And I think in part, uh, I mean, the Ukrainian people get the most, um, the most credit for that. But a part of that credit goes to the work of the United States and um, and to me as the ambassador in in the United uh, in Ukraine. Ambassador, um, 
You've shown the courage to come forward today and testify. Notwithstanding the fact you were urged by the White House or State Department not to, notwithstanding the fact that, as you testified earlier, the President implicitly threatened you in that call record, and now the President in real time is attacking you, what effect do you think that has on other witnesses' willingness to come forward and expose wrongdoing? Well, it's very intimidating. It's designed to intimidate, is it not? I mean, I can't speak to what the President is trying to do, but I think the effect is to be intimidating. Well, I want to let you know, Ambassador, that some of us here take witness intimidation very, very seriously. Mr. Goldman. Ambassador Ivanovich, you indicated that those same articles in March that included the smear campaign also included allegations related to Ukraine's interference in the 2016 election and the Burisma-Biden connection. Is that right? Yes. So I'm going to end my questioning where we were before, which was the July 25th call. And President Trump not only insults you and praises the corrupt prosecutor general, but he also, as you know by now, references these two investigations. First, immediately after President Zelensky thanks President Trump for his, quote, great support in the area of defense, unquote, President Trump responds, I would like you to do us a favor, though, because our country has been through a lot and Ukraine knows a lot about it. I would like you to find out what happened with this whole situation with Ukraine. They say crowd strike. I guess you have one of your wealthy people, the server. They say Ukraine has it. And then he goes on in that same paragraph to say, whatever you can do, it's very important that you do it if that's possible. Now, Ambassador Ivanovich, from your experience as the ambassador in Ukraine for almost three years, and understanding that President Zelensky was not in politics before he ran for president and was a new president on this call, how would you expect President Zelensky to interpret a request for a favor? The U.S. Uh, relationship for Ukraine is the single most important relationship. And so I think that um, President Zelensky, any president, would um, you know, do what they could to um, you know, lean in on a favor request. I'm not saying that that's a yes. I'm saying they would try to lean in and see what they could do. Fair to say that a president of Ukraine that is so dependent on the United States would do just about anything within his power to please the president of the United States, if he could? You know, if he could. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there are limits, uh, and I understand there were a lot of discussions in the Ukrainian government about all of this. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, we are an important relationship on the security side and on the political side. And so the president of Ukraine, uh, one of the most important functions that individual has is to make sure the relationship with the U.S. is rock solid. Now, are you familiar with these allegations of Ukrainian interference in the 2016 election? I mean, there have been rumors out there about things like that, but, uh, you know, uh, there was nothing hard, at least nothing that I was aware of. There was nothing based in fact to right. support these allegations. Yes. And in fact, who was responsible for interfering and meddling in the 2016 election? Well, the U.S. intelligence community has concluded that it was Russia. Ambassador Ivanovich, are you aware that in February of 2017, Vladimir Putin himself promoted this theory of Ukrainian interference in the 2016 election? You know, maybe I knew that once and have forgotten, but I, I'm not familiar with it now. Well, let me show you a press statement that 
President Putin made in a joint press conference with Viktor Orban of Hungary on February 2nd of 2017, where he says, second, as we all know, during the presidential campaign in the United States, the Ukrainian government adopted a unilateral position in favor of one candidate. More than that, certain oligarchs, certainly with the approval of the political leadership, funded this candidate, or female candidate, to be more precise. Now, how would this theory of Ukraine interference in the 2016 election be in Vladimir Putin's interest? Well, uh, I mean, President Putin must have been aware that uh, there were concerns in the U.S. about uh, Russian meddling in the 2016 elections and what the potential was for Russian meddling in the future. Uh, so, uh, you know, classic uh, for uh, an intelligence officer to try to throw off the scent and, you know, create an alternative narrative that maybe might get picked up and get some credence. An alternative narrative that would absolve his own wrongdoing? Yeah. And when he talks about an oligarch, and he talks about the support of the Ukrainian government. There's also a reference in the July 25th call to a wealthy Ukrainian. Is it your understanding that what Vladimir Putin is saying here in this press statement in February 2017 is similar to what President Trump says on the July 25th call related to the 2016 election? Maybe. Now let me show you another exhibit from the call related to the Bidens, which I'm sure you're familiar with. President Trump says the other thing, there's a lot of talk about Biden's son, that Biden stopped the prosecution, and a lot of people want to find out about that. So whatever you can do with the Attorney General would be great. Biden went around bragging that he stopped the prosecution, so if you can look into it, it sounds horrible to me. Now, are you familiar with the allegation, these allegations related to Vice President Biden? Yes. <clears throat> Do you know whether he ever went around bragging that he stopped the prosecution of anyone? No. And in fact, when Vice President Biden acted to remove the former corrupt prosecutor in Ukraine, did he do so as part of official United States policy? Official U.S. policy. And that was, was endorsed and um, was the policy of a number of other international stakeholders, other countries, other um, monetary institutions, financial institutions. And in fact, if he re helped to remove a corrupt Ukrainian prosecutor general who was not prosecuting enough corruption, that would increase the chances that corrupt companies in Ukraine would be investigated. Isn't that right? One would think so. And that could include Burisma, right? Yes. Now, at the time of this call, Vice President Biden was the front runner for the Democratic nomination for president and President Trump's potential next opponent in the election. Is it your understanding that President Trump's request to have Vice President Biden investigated, was that part of official U.S. policy as you knew it? Well, I should say that I had, uh, at the time of this phone call, I had already departed Ukraine two months pre prior. Right, but you're familiar with it. It didn't change that much in two months, right? It, it, it certainly would not have been the policy in May when I left. And were, you, were these two investigations part of the anti-corruption platform that you championed in Ukraine for three years? No. And these investigations, do they appear to you to be to benefit the president's personal and political interests rather than the national interest? Well, they certainly could. Now, just returning to the allegations in the Hill publication in March that were promoted by Mr. Giuliani, the president's lawyer, were those two allegations similar to the two allegations that the president wanted President Zelensky to investigate? Yes. So ultimately, in the July 25th phone call with the Ukrainian president, 
President of the United States endorsed the false allegations against you and the Bidens. Is that right? Yes. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I have a parliamentary inquiry, please. The gentleman will suspend. Um, votes are fairly imminent. We're going to take a brief recess. Uh, I would ask everyone to remain uh, sure enough to, to allow the Parliament witness to, please. to exit the room. Um, and we will resume uh, after votes. Mr. Chairman, I have a point of inquiry. The gentleman can uh, seek recognition after we resume. Hi, everyone. I'm Nicole Wallace. We've been watching the testimony of Marie Yovanovitch in front of the House Intelligence Committee overseeing Donald Trump's impeachment proceedings. I'm joined by Chris Matthews here in New York. Chris, what do you think of what we've been watching? Well, I think we've seen news made in real time here with the uh, chairman basically accusing the President of the United States in real time again of witness intimidation by putting out that tweet, uh, basically undercutting the credibility of this witness by saying that wherever she goes in the world, she causes trouble, which is in a way an inane assessment of her role as an ambassador, that she can in fact create havoc in countries by merely her posting there. But it would be a way, I could see the chairman's argument, of frustrating the witness's testimony, well, which is a crime. This is a witness uh, who is there not just as a fact witness, as the witnesses on Tuesday, but as a victim, sort of patient zero of the smear campaign orchestrated by Donald Trump yeah. and by Rudy Giuliani. So to see her smeared in real time, by the well, you've used a great word, because that's the word that's at the heart of this, because in, the, in order to get her out of the way so they could carry out their escapade, if you will, to use uh, Ukraine to make their case politically against the Bidens and, and, and according to, uh, backing up their 2016 theory about Ukrainian involvement in our elections, uh, they wanted her out of the way. She was an inconvenient ambassador, and they smeared her. And uh, the President of the United States said that he will, she's going to have some things coming her way, which sounds pretty uh, intimidating, in fact, a bit uh, frightening. Uh, we are very lucky to be joined here by an amazing team of legal eagles, political analysts, and a former senator, just for good measure. MSNBC legal analyst Maya Wiley is here. She previously worked in the civil division of the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of New York, many intersections, Southern District of New York, investigating the aforementioned Rudy Giuliani, former U.S. Attorney, as well as former FBI Chief of Staff, MSNBC contributor Chuck Rosenberg also joins us, former Democratic Senator from from Missouri, and our political analyst, we are lucky to say, our MSNBC and NBC, Claire McCaskill, politics editor for The Root and MSNBC political contributor, Jason Johnson's here, also from California, burning up the Twitter, Ambassador Michael McFall, who served as U.S. Ambassador to Russia in the Obama administration, is here, lucky for us. He, too, is now an MSNBC international affairs analyst. Let me start with you, Ambassador McFall, your reaction to Chris's observation of what is obviously the news of the hour real-time witness tampering, witness intimidation by the president into the testimony, live testimony, of former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, Marie Ivanovich. Well, the first thing I want to say is I think she's doing a fantastic job. I know Ambassador Ivanovich, uh, cool and calm, sticking to the facts under very difficult circumstances. But that tweet was just outrageous. Uh, I don't know what the legal implications are. You have a lot of legal people there that can talk about it. But as somebody who has served this country uh, uh, and somebody who knows what the State Department people do, for him to go after her while she is testifying, and let's just be clear, completely crazy stuff. Like somehow some low-level diplomat is responsible for what happened in Somalia. Uh, and then just to correct the record, what she when she was in Ukraine, things got better in Ukraine and she was fighting corruption effectively. Uh, and then he took her out because he didn't like the work that she was doing on behalf of the United States. I, I, I'm sorry. I just found it really outrageous. and I'm deeply disappointed in the president of the United States. Ambassador, I can hear the emotion in your voice. Let's unpack all of this um, sort of point by point. Let me start with the allegation that an American ambassador in a war zone 
was doing anything other than improving a very dire situation how does that land to other current sitting american ambassadors most of the time in these hardship posts they are career foreign service officers what did you hear if you're sitting doing diplomatic work in syria or iraq or afghanistan from the president this morning you know he's he's the commander in chief he's the, they're all appointed by him ambassadors are their purse they personally represent the president of the united states when they're appointed right you get a letter from the president that you are the president's representative it's just incredibly demeaning and it obviously also underscores the president of the united states doesn't understand what diplomats do doesn't understand what ambassadors do um and then the last point um these are Americans who, you know, 33 years Ambassador Yovanovitch has served this country. Democrats, Republicans, I've known her for 25 years. I couldn't tell you if she's a Democrat or Republican. And you, you heard the places she's served. Have you been to Bishkek? I've been to Bishkek. That is not some cushy, overpaid job with a bunch of, you know, uh, lovely drinks for ambassadors. These are hard places to serve. Ukraine was at war and is at war during the time she's serving there. And for, her, for the president to go after somebody like that, uh, it's just wrong. It's just deeply wrong. And uh, I hope he'll be held accountable for that. I hope they'll be pushed back, not just from me, but I hope from other Republicans who love our country as much as I do. This is not the American way. You know, Chuck Rosenberg, there's so much that happens um, because Trump does such a volume business of debasing the office, he feels. We don't pause and analyze every little thing he does, but let's pause on this. Is there any policy at the United States Justice Department where what he did, if he were anybody else, would be addressed? Well, sure. It, there are statutes that um, criminalize conduct. Really? Obstruction of justice, obstruction of congressional hearings. Title 18 of the United States Code, Section 1505. Look it up. Uh, I, you know, prosecutors love timelines, and so I have a question about a timeline something that happened today. Uh, Ambassador Yovanovitch, as Michael McFall said, testified with great dignity and reserve, uh, I thought, you know, cogently and thoughtfully, but that she was intimidated by the president's earlier uh, tweets, uh, earlier statements about her, that she was going to go through something. Was he listening? Did he know she had been intimidated? And did he then tweet? Uh, that, uh, you know, she had served poorly? Was he sticking the knife in the back of a witness who already acknowledged that she was intimidated? Because that compounds it, in my view. If it was just out of the blue, and lots of things are with this president, that's bad. If it was in response to her earlier testimony at this hearing today that she had been intimidated previously, that's awful. People that have covered Donald Trump for years as a reality TV figure um, and a I guess attempted business person. I don't know what he describes himself as in that category. Describe him as a counterpuncher. It's very different when you're punching against a witness in your own impeachment. It's very different. And what you're saying, Nicole, building on what Chuck said, actually goes straight to his motivation. This is a witness who has very clearly undermined his one defense, his one defense, which is that I wasn't doing this for my personal gain. I was doing this because I was generally concerned with corruption. And based on her experience in the Ukraine, having been there since 2016, what she laid out was not only that the Ukrainians had made progress and that it was a significantly important time in the fight against corruption and in her efforts there, that the very people he was listening to were the folks who were corrupt and the people maligning her were the people who had been removed or were about to be removed from office mm -hmm. for their corruption. And one of them, Lutschenko himself, is currently under investigation in the U Ukraine today for abuse of power in his position by his former office. This is who we're talking about and that is why she has been a critical witness today. And the fact that we have a president who, when he tweets these things out, also knows that people's lives become threatened. Because in addition to what Chuck said, it's not just that the president is intimidating her directly, it's also putting her in danger because others who support him, unfortunately, may now threaten her life. I think he, that she scared the hell out of him. I think her power, her passion, her 
loyalty, uh, her credibility was so powerful and so careful. Yes, I Notice can. how she began by saying, here's what I don't know. Boy, does that establish your credibility. Mm -hmm. Here's what I don't know, what happened before me, what happened after me. I don't know some things that happened while I was there. That is amazingly affirming of your determination to tell only the truth. And I think Trump doesn't understand that kind of discipline, but he was afraid of it. Right. That's what I think happened today, and that's why he jumped in. Remember, they put out a White House statement just minutes before. Mm -hmm. He's only going to watch uh, Nunes' comments because they're f affirming of him, of course, and playing to him. And then he yes. somehow Hello. is watching this star witness today, and he feels that she has gotten a high road on okay. him, and he's got to come back. That's She was provoking him by her credibility. And as we're, we're going to, I'm sorry, we're going to jump in and listen to Chairman Schiff. Uh, for no reason, he's got good reason, um, but we saw today witness intimidation in real time by the President of the United States. Once again, going after this dedicated and respected career public servant uh, in an effort to not only chill her, but to chill others uh, who may come forward. Um, we take this kind of witness intimidation and obstruction of inquiry very seriously. Do you think that's a peaceful fact, witness intimidation and peaceful fact, sir? I believe we are looking for our own Garrett Hake. Garrett, are you hearing us yet? Garrett? Yeah, hey, I'm, I'm with you, Nicole. Yep, hello. Yes, Garrett, what, what was Nicole, the... Uh, two just things take I, me I through that, yeah, go ahead. Well, I just a couple things from the room that I don't know how well they carried on TV. The first is Yovanovitch is such a soft speaker. It really demands the attention of all these lawmakers. They handed out her opening statement on paper beforehand, and you had folks pouring over it as she was speaking and essentially having to lean in to everything she was saying just to hear her. So she commanded the room in a different way than Bill Taylor did on Wednesday, just by requiring lawmakers to pay such close attention. And then I imagine this was probably more palpable on television, their frustration of Republicans at the way that Adam Schiff controlled that hearing. He was locking down the room anytime they tried to raise a point of order. And in fact, there was, uh, by calling the recess here exactly when they did, the, the break in this hearing, Republicans now won't even get a crack at Yovanovitch for probably at least an hour. They have a long series of votes that they have to take here first. So Yovanovitch gets to give her opening statement, this long questioning by Democrats, and now a significant break before Republicans can present any kind of counter narrative. And it's obvious what that will be just from the, the reactions of the folks in the room, which is, so what? That she gives this powerful testimony, but that it doesn't relate directly to what would be theoretically the impeachable conduct. And I think that's what you're going to hear all afternoon when the questioning resumes with the Republican side. Garrett Haig, thank you. Um, Claire McCaskill, the idea that Yovanovitch is somehow unrelated. Yovanovitch is, 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 as I said to Chris, patient zero. I mean, she is the first evidence of Donald Trump's involvement in a smear campaign. He's the um, architect of it. Rudy Giuliani, Lev Parnas, and his guys on the ground in Ukraine were carrying uh, absolutely. it out. Absolutely. I mean, I remember so when he... So here's the deal. Rudy Giuliani and Trump cooked up this plan to find a way to go after Biden. And Giuliani had all these contacts on the dark side um, all around the globe, including some of the ones that are currently being prosecuted in this country, those two nuts from down in Florida, and then this bad guy in the Ukraine. So they had to gin up some dirt on Biden coming from the Ukraine, and Judy had friends that could help him do that. Corrupt friends, bad guys. So, who was in the way? I am so proud of this woman. She was the most senior, highest ranking woman diplomat in the State Department. Now, saying that is something because the State Department, historically over the last 30 years, has not exactly been where you go to find all the powerful women in Washington. Usually it was a lot of men, a lot of white men. And the fact that she has served and that she was in the way this is who they had to get rid of. To complete their scam, they had to get rid of this woman. And so they set about to do it with an assist from Sean Hannity and ridiculous pretend journalism outlets. They went after her and the president now, not staying in the shadows for this bad act, but rather he's out there today with his fat thumbs tweeting 
uh, to try to intimidate her real time. I'm so proud of her. And every woman in America who has fought in a male-dominated career should cheer for this woman today. Her guts, her accomplishments, and the fact that she's the one that stood in their way. I've been on TV with you hours and hours and hours. I've never seen this much emotion in your voice. What is it about Yovanovitch's experience and sort of, she seems to me like she ran into the wood chipper of Trump's corruption. What, can, what is it about her experience that has you like that? I can get choked up when I think about what this woman has given. If you really walk in her shoes, the country she's gone to, the loneliness that comes with postings like this in the State Department, her accomplishments, the respect she gained over decades and decades of service, and to have these jerks malign the office of the presidency and play this kind of game for political purposes, it should infuriate every American. We can't walk in her shoes, but we can live in her words, Jason Johnson. And what she said today was, if malign foreign actors, basically, if malign foreign actors can orchestrate the removal of an American ambassador fighting corruption, right. and what else can they do? She's basically laying out the Homeland uh, script from a couple seasons ago, but in this version, Donald Trump is the useful idiot. Yeah, it, it's it, there were so many things that were striking, and I also thought of Sally Yates. I thought about the fact that this right. is an administration Another that hates example. powerful women. So. If you're, an, if you're a powerful right. woman, regardless of how you ended up getting into your position, they hate you, they want you gone, they want to intimidate you. But, but there are a couple of things here that they are so disturbing. When, when I heard her speak about how frightened she was, right? This isn't finding out that your name is in a high school slam book, right? The president of the United States is insulting you to another world leader and then lies about it and says, oh, he called you a bad person. No, you're the one who said she's bad news and he's parroting it back to you because he has to because that's the only way you can negotiate with this president of the United States. All of those things are incredibly disturbing and demonstrate that this is an administration that simply removes people whenever they need to in order to engage in whatever kind of corrupt behavior they want to get into. And I also think this, and this, I think this is going to be key going forward. Very difficult for the Republicans to go after someone with her kind of resume and say that either she is a partisan or that she doesn't make sense when clearly she was in a position of power and influence and support within that country and no one seems to have an explanation for why she's removed. Uh, and, and that I found between that and the fact that we basically saw a, an impeachment version of celebrity mean tweets while we're going through an impeachment hearing is an indicator of how frightened this administration is and what depths they will go through in order to achieve whatever sort of corrupt agenda they have, regardless of how many people get destroyed in the process. Yeah. And I wonder, uh, you know, having grown up in the Cold War, uh, where we hid under our desks because the Russians were coming, uh, and I was at the wall when it happened, and I was in Budapest when it happened, and we were the good guys, and the people that fought corruption over there and fought communism and tyranny, and those who, a young kid came up to me at the Berlin Wall and said, freedom to him was talking to me. Yeah. Mm. And we were the good guys. How did our president jump the wall and get on the other side, attacking Americans for causing the, the horrors of uh, Somalia, the dragging of an American soldier through the, through the streets? I mean, she's responsible for that. You know, blaming America first used to be the, the taunt of the far left. You know, they would attack us for everything. Right. You know, the President of the United States blames an American ambassador for the horrors of the Third World, for the evils and corruptions of beyond the Iron Curtain, which he is helping to restore. It's unbelievable. If I were a Republican, I would say, I'm serious, I'm not a Republican, I'll admit it. <laughs> and I, if I were a Republican, I'd say, what happened to my goddamn party? We used to be the good guys in the Cold War. How come this joker is on the other side? Because right now, today, you can call him a joker, right now. When he calls up into a tweet to try to intimidate a live witness to prove the argument that he's above the law, to prove the argument that he is able to call a witness, humiliate her, blame her for all the wrongs of the world, and somehow this proves he's right, it proves he's the bad guy. Right. I mean, I, I'm an extraordinary to talk like this, but it's right in our face. How well, can you not say what we just saw? And by the way, the chairman was quick-witted enough to move. And by the way, Danny Goldman is the best counsel I've seen. He knows how to keep his place. He doesn't act like a congressman. He doesn't show a lot of personality. But he's damn good at using the witness to be the witness. Right. And she's so much. I think my bottom line a couple minutes ago, this president is afraid of that witness. And let's, that's why he's going a little crazy right now. Let's show him going crazy. We don't seek to amplify uh, the, the toxic things he disseminates through his Twitter feed, but this may ultimately be evidence against Donald J. Trump. Here's his effort at witness intimidation this morning, delivered 
via tweet. Donald Trump, everywhere Marie Ivanovich went, turned bad. She started off in Somalia, had that go. Then fast forward to Ukraine, where the new Ukrainian president spoke unfavorably about her in my second phone call with him. It is a U.S. president's absolute right to appoint ambassadors. They call it serving at the pleasure of the president. The U.S. now has a very strong and powerful foreign policy, much different than proceed. I don't think that's the word he meant. Uh, it is called, quite simply, America. For, uh, we're going to stop there. Um, let, let me ask you this, Chris. Donald Trump is now squarely on the side of the corrupt actors in Ukraine. It would seem that if Republicans want to make this pleasure of the president argument, its weakness is that what the president, what causes him, what brings him pleasure is siding with bad actors and autocrats. Well, you know, to use a phrase of the left, I'll say a deep history. After the fall of the, of the Iron Curtain, Tremendous amounts of economic power fell into the hands of the oligarchs. They were once in the power of the nomenclatura, the big shots of the Soviet world. Then that power fell into the hands of the oligarchs. All that money sloshing around behind the old iron curtain, looking for ways to use that money and to clean it up, of course, to launder it. See, in the United States on K Street, we have people like Bob Livingston and Jim Slattery and all those, and Rudy Giuliani, all kinds of people looking for incomes after their public service, if you will. Where do they find income? From sleep these balls of the world who have to improve their image in the United States. The good countries of the world don't need to buy us. The bad guys have to buy us. So they find willing sellers of the keys to the city of Washington. They're there on K Street. That's where the big money is. We're, you know, working for President Moy of Kenya, all the bad guys, they know where the money is. The sleaze balls have to buy good reputations. So Giuliani's over there, he's got his till out for himself the whole time he's going around. You think he's doing this for pro bono for the president? He's, oh. made, he's got all kinds of, as you said a few minutes ago, or somebody did, he has so many contacts among the sleaze balls of the behind the iron curtain wall because that's where the money is. So he knew to the contact, but they're all working against us. And they're working against this straight arrow woman. I shouldn't call her woman because that's the president's language. This State Department hero. And, and, and she's standing up as like the only tree in the forest still standing against all this sleaze and all this money sloshing around, getting into the hands of American sellouts who are trying to make a buck over here. And it's a horrendous situation, so we find ourselves in the crosshairs of it right now in a hearing where the President of the United States jumps in on the side of the bad guys in real time for all to see. You know, this is reality television, ladies and gentlemen, mm -hmm. and he's gonna, he may be you know, hoisted on his own petard here yeah. because he's walking right into a real situation to show. Remember the McCarthy hearings. Remember what McCarthy did when he tried to destroy that young report, that young uh, uh, lawyer. And that's when Joe Welch jumped on him and said, you know, until this time, I didn't realize how indecent you are. Have you no decency? Somebody should say the president, if he has anybody around him in the loop that can say it. Who would that be? Shut up. Who would that be? I don't know who it is. I think he got they're rid all of gone. all the trees. That, they're all gone. Yeah. 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 They're all right. The people who could say that to him, he's gotten rid of them. And now he's just got sycophants. He's just got people, you know, they, the, what does Winston Mulvaney say? Let Trump be Trump. Well, mm -hmm. we just he saw is. it. And we'll see how that works out for him. So we've been watching compelling testimony this morning from career foreign service officer, former American ambassador to Ukraine, Marie Ivanovich, during the second round of public hearings in the impeachment inquiry into Donald Trump on Capitol Hill. I'm Nicole Wallace in New York this morning. We heard a damning indictment of Rudy Giuliani's shadow foreign policy in Ukraine, acting on behalf of his client, Donald Trump. Something fell. We're all okay. <laughs> we also heard a gripping recollection from Ambassador Yovanovitch of the moment she found out how the president smeared her in that controversial July 25th phone call with the new president of Ukraine. I was shocked and devastated that um, I would feature in a phone call between two heads of state uh, in such a manner uh, where um, President Trump said that I was bad news to another world leader uh, and that I would be going through some things. Um, so I was, it, it was, it was a terrible moment. Uh, a person who saw me actually reading the transcript said that the color drained from my face. I think I even had a physical reaction. Um, I, I think, you know, even now words kind of fail me. What did you think when President Trump told President Zelensky and you read that you were going to go through some things? I didn't know what to think, um, but I was very concerned. What were you concerned about? 
she's gonna go through some things. It didn't sound good. It sounded like a threat. Did you feel threatened? I did. Threats against America's ambassador in Ukraine, our sitting ambassador, rushed out of that country, not because she faced danger in a challenging posting from anyone in that country. And she was a, an anti-corruption crusader the day she was withdrawn from her post. She'd attended um, a service, a funeral, for um, one of that country's crusaders against corruption in, in, in Ukraine. Her threats, her, her, her intimidators, the American president, um, either a complicit or impotent secretary of state, and his agents. Now, let me say something about that, Nicole, because this makes me very, very angry. Secretary of State is Mike Pompeo. Like any leader, I think he has three obligations. First, to the public, the American people. Uh, second, to the mission of his agency. And third, and just as important, to the men and women who serve in that agency. His silence is deafening. It is an act of abject cowardice. I am astonished that somebody who went to West Point Sorry was about an that, army folks. officer does not have the spine to stand up for the people in his organization who are being denigrated by this president. That silence, as I said, is deafening and it is disgusting. Does it suggest more than weakness, though? Does it suggest that he's a complicit actor in this dark op? You know, complicity will be determined down the road as we adduce more facts. Uh, I know what I see, and what I see from him is a complete failure of leadership. I doubt he's watching this show, and I doubt he's listening to me. Uh, but if he was, uh, I, would tell him that a, I would tell him he's a coward. Let's bring in Eric Swalwell, he's a member of the committee, a Democrat, of course. Uh, Congressman, thank you. What did you make of the president's interruption in your hearing today by tweet, basically attacking the witness? By attacking the witness, the president continues to act guilty, uh, Chris. Uh, the president is trying to intimidate Ambassador Yovanovitch, but guess what? It, it's not going to work. It didn't work when he and his allies smeared her while she was in Ukraine. It didn't work when he smeared her on the phone call with President Zelensky on July 25. And it's not working as she's sitting there testifying to us. But we are looking at this as a consciousness of guilt. Innocent people don't act this way. You only act... This Sorry about my phone falling. I uh, had to go outside to do an well fitness assessment just now pertaining to my health care deal. And I was disrupted from the meetings that I'll have to now um, reevaluate back up on and my telephone fell whenever I was coming back into into uh, into the facility here she done a field test examination of me in the regards towards doing this field test and I guess this is what that she was a part of here you go right here these was the things that she just got through going over with me I didn't want it done out uh, inside due to the fact that uh, due to the fact that uh, I was recording These are her remarks, suggestions towards what she recommends in those regards. Let's go back now to the broadcast here. Once more, I'm sorry for the interruptions. Um, I do want to listen to a little bit more of this due to the fact that I did have to take a temporary break and my phone did fall sorry about that to my viewers hopefully uh, 
hopefully I've got things. Back like they should be. I'm not a professional recording person, so if I don't do something just right, please don't hold it against me. I could not make remarks off of the remarks that they was making due to the fact that I was disrupted. I knew that I had an appointment towards these people going to drive in here and do this today. This is the first time that I've ever had them do something this extent towards checking my blood pressure, checking my pulse, checking. They made me take my shoes off because of my type 2 diabetes. They checked my toes, they checked my fingers. Uh, they asked me all kinds of different questions. Uh, it was like a well fitness examination field test, but it was actually done out in my car and also out in my front yard due to the fact that I didn't want them in here during the time that I was recording. This way, if you have a knowledge of your own guilt, but I do worry that this could have a chilling effect on others who have seen wrongdoing and may not come forward because of what the president's doing. Well, let's talk about that because the witness in this case, though, a strong person, a strong, uh, uh, I think, patriotic person, uh, admitted that she was chilled, as you, you word you chose, uh, when she heard that the president was coming after her, said there's going to things are going to happen to this person. Is it your sense that the president's aware he had some influence on her? And therefore, he was going to do it again. In other words, he was recidivism here, full, full, full grown. I've worked once. Let's do it again. Do you think yeah. there's an actual case here for an article, article of impeachment, uh, obstruction of Congress generally, but intimidation of the witness particularly? We have strong evidence of obstruction of justice through intimidating a witness and tampering uh, with the witness's testimony. And Chris, this was the person you would want in Ukraine if you were interested in fighting corruption. She had built her career as an anti-corruption ambassador. So the fact that the president removed her was not to stop corruption in Ukraine. It was to weaponize corruption for his own personal gain. And I think the fact the phone call that was released today, you did not hear once on the congratulatory phone call the president bring up corruption, despite his own White House lying to the American people and saying that he did discuss corruption. And you didn't hear on the July 25 phone call the president discussed corruption. He got rid of the very person who would have rooted out corruption in Ukraine to put in his people to help him personally. Congressman, uh, Ambassador Yovanovitch today said this. She said, our Ukraine policy has been thrown into disarray and shady interests the world over, over have learned how little it takes to remove an American ambassador who does not give them what they want. It's been reported that the diplomats in the region uh, were trying to deal with a president whose mind had been poisoned. What do you expect from the Republicans on this committee to defend a president whose mind was poisoned against Marie Yovanovitch? Yeah, my Republican colleagues have argued that the president has a right to hire and fire whoever he wishes, uh, and, and that is true to an extent. Uh, you can fire someone for a good reason. You cannot fire someone for a corrupt reason, and the evidence here is that he fired someone for a corrupt reason. Nicole, you can you know, fire any employee that's at will, but you can't fire them because of their race, you can't fire them because of their gender, and you certainly cannot fire them to carry out the corrupt practices as the president did. Congressman, are you reading anything into the degree of alarm? The White House uh, muddled through the day Tuesday. The president's allies stayed with quite petty insults, I think making fun of the witnesses, um, cups, drinking, drinking water bottle. Um, today, they went for the jugular. What threat does this witness represent to Donald Trump's presidency? Well, she was blocking Donald Trump's intentions for Ukraine. For him to run this shakedown scheme, he could not have an anti-corruption crusader. He needed Rudy Giuliani and Ambassador Sondland and others in place to really shake down the Ukrainians to personally benefit uh, himself. She is standing strong. George Kent, Ambassador Taylor, they stood strong. It's my hope that other witnesses continue to stand strong, come forward if they've seen something wrong, and recognize that we are going to protect them from intimidation, uh, and doing the right thing will prevail uh, and be rewarded. Congressman, you know, you're a young guy in politics, and by the way, I'm glad you're still in the House. You didn't get caught up in giving up, giving up your seat to run for president. 
But I, I have to ask you, when you're with your colleagues on the airplane going back and forth to California, when you actually have social time with people on the other side of the aisle, how do they, do they say this is a game we have to play because we don't want to get primary? Or do they really stick in character and pretend they really think Trump's the good guy here? How do they behave? Because I don't know how they stand for this. My thoughts. Your thoughts. Uh, they have shifting uh, defenses for him. Uh, many of them say uh, they're going to try and overdo and overthrow an election. Uh, and and I, I understand that. But at what point do we say that we have to stand up for the Constitution and this emboldens him if we do nothing? Chris, one of them told me uh, on our committee, he said, I understand why you guys are doing this, just don't rush it. And what he was trying to tell me was make sure it's a fair process. And I think the American people are seeing that this process is fair. Republicans will be able to question the witness when we go back into the hearing room. Uh, but there is uh, really no way to defend uh, the facts uh, that continue to come forward. Congressman, one last question about the investigative track of the impeachment proceedings. There's a closed door deposition um, with at least one, I believe two new witnesses today. What does what the investigative track look like today? Yeah, so again, we are showing a, a witness you know, who was fired for being an anti-corruption uh, crusader, uh, but we're also going to hear from Mr. Holmes, who is a potential witness uh, to Ambassador Sondland's phone call with the president the day after uh, the shakedown on July 25. That's going to be a deposition to see if he has relevant evidence. We're moving swiftly, we're moving fairly, and we, we have pressure on ourselves, you know, because of an upcoming election, to make sure that we understand what happened and recommend to our colleagues how, if in any way, we should hold the president accountable. Congressman Swallow, thank you for spending some time with us. We'll be watching. My pleasure. Thanks, guys. We're going to turn to the White House, where uh, our correspondent Hans Nichols is gathering yeah. reaction to the uh, wildfire set in motion by the president himself with an attempt to intimidate a witness in real time. Well, there are meetings right now taking place. One just ended between Pat Cipollone, the White House counsel, and Hogan Gidley, who's the deputy press secretary. Now, Cipollone just left that meeting. My colleague, Holly Jackson, asked him if he thought it was witness intimidation what the president just did. He didn't answer, but guys, let me tell you why these meetings are significant. Because there's one meeting between Pat Cipollone uh, and Hogan Gidley, and right across, there's another one between Mick Mulvaney and Stephanie Grisham. Now, Mulvaney and Pat Cipollone have been reportedly been at odds. And you get the sense that this is truly a unified White House strategy, that you wouldn't have separate meetings in all these different power nodes, power centers throughout the White House. We also know that the main power center is the president and his Twitter feed, and he's clearly watching this in real time and responding. That's a different approach than what we had on Wednesday, where there was a bit of a delay. I will say something the White House did this morning, trying to put out that letter, get in front of it, the, excuse me, the initial call. All right, this is going to end this. Uh, this will be part three in one. Part three in one pertaining to these impeachment hearings that once more I call nanny nanny boo boo hearings. Nanny nanny boo boo, nanny nanny boo boo, you can't catch me, you can't catch me. This will end this particular segment. Thank you.